Hey everybody, how's it going? I'm going to go ahead and get started here in just a minute. I uh, just wanted to give you one more update uh, that we are still in uh, that 10 day window of uh, baby potentially coming. So again, I'll still have my phone with me just in case. I should get a message that it's going to happen that we'll be cutting short and uh, closing this off and heading out of here um, pretty quickly. Thank you all for joining. I'll give everybody a second to get on here. I was kind of surprised by this topic and how uh, popular and how um, much support we had for putting this out. Uh, just in the last like three days of putting up my email address and asking people if they were interested in getting the PDF uh, afterwards to email me. I've had over 10 people already send me emails and we haven't even done it yet. So it's really cool to see uh, some of these um, little impromptu presentations kind of kicking off. I'm loving doing them and as long as you're all finding uh, some good content in it and some good value, I'll keep doing them. So thank you uh, for being on here. Um, one of the big things we want to hit about today is uh, bringing forth, I don't want to really say like reality check, but really kind of bringing into the mindset of the personal trainer who's considering going to open their own studio or their own, their own small gym. Um, what really is included in all this and all the steps that kind of come into it, okay? So jumping into this, one of the first things that we want to do, uh, I know this is a little bit tiny for you to see on here, but hopefully you'll be able to keep on. Um, this is basically a breakdown of three different articles I've done for the NSCA's Personal Trainer Quarterly. So you'll see the little link down here to them. I can email you these as well. If you're an NSCA member, you already have access to these. Uh, but this first one here is, is basically defining and breaking down a business model for what you currently are. Because I think this is one of the bigger issues that we see in our industry right now. I know it's a, a huge um, financial problem, is uh, personal trainers that are classified as independent contractors, this is typically the, the issue, that are classified as independent contractors but are being treated as and required to do duties as a, as a, an employee. And uh, the problem with that is a couple of things. Number one, um, you as the independent contractor you're doing duties or jobs that an employee should be paid an hourly wage for or a higher commission or whatever it might be, you are, are being gypped that in a sense, plus the opportunity to build your business to a uh, consistent level, it depends on the state of how many hours, I think California is 32 hours a week of consistent incomes, consistent clients that show up to where you could earn benefits if your business offers you that. The business itself doesn't want to do that because they don't want to pay taxes or health benefits or even offer you any of that kind of stuff. So you'll see some, some gyms or some franchises, they'll cap you at 25 sessions per week or 25 hours per week, uh, or they'll, they'll only allow you to take so many clients or only work to certain bits. But the, the big issue is, what are you really? Are you an independent contractor or are you an employee? And there's no one clear line across the, the board, but some of the really big ones that kind of come into this are, are you required to wear a uniform? Um, who collects the money? Do you collect the money or does the company collect the money? Whose paperwork and forms are you using? Who contacts the client for scheduling, booking, those types of things? Um, are you working floor hours? Do you have required hours you need to be there? Are you able to reference your website, your business, or do you have to use theirs? And, and so if, if two or three or say more of these all kind of come into, yes, I have to wear a uniform, the business collects the money, uh, I have a set hour number of hours I'm allowed to work, you're an employee, okay? Uh, the company does all the paperwork, I have to use their websites. There's, there's quite a few of these. Um, one of the, the really good articles, um, I forget her name right now, uh, man, it'll come to me, Melissa something, she was in uh, PFP Magazine, you'll see a couple of her articles pop up. But she does the whole, you know, if it sounds like a duck and, and it looks like a duck, it's probably a duck. If you have three or four of these where you're being treated like an employee, you're an employee and you're kind of missing the opportunity on that. So the first thing we need to look at before you really make this jump is, are you truly an independent contractor? And the reason I want to do that is this is where you can have um, some of the clashes come up of, uh, you know, working within the area. Did, did you have or did you sign uh, a form that, you know, uh, basically a, a work requirement in the area? Uh, that, that doesn't allow you to recruit, recruit clientele or open a business within a, a certain distance in the area. That's an employee typically that has to sign something along those lines. Independent contractors don't technically have to do that and so on. So this is something I want you to think about is which one are you truly? And then moving forward, budgetary wise, before even considering going off and, and jumping into open and running something on your own, can you do it well? Can you budget and run a business and build a business well where you're at? 
And so there's a couple of options with that. You might be an independent renting space inside another gym. You might be an employee working for someone else building a clientele inside that gym. Either way, you still have the ability to run yourself, run a business as you. Uh, even as the employee, you're still building your own product, okay? So by that, we need to define what your rent is, your insurance, your recertification fees, any equipment that you are buying, you know, bringing into the gym, or if you home travel, if you're traveling to other people's homes uh, and going in, which in this day and age is, is, a, is a touchy subject, it's a challenging uh, business model to do, uh, is, is, is doable, there is a uh, very right way and a safe way of doing that, in my opinion, maybe an, another, another talk for that on another day, uh, but these are opportunities where you're gonna be buying you know, pretty good amounts of equipment, bringing them, traveling them, maintenancing your car, all these types of things. So we need to create a budget, and on the next page here, I'll show you the budget, that, that more or less looks at how you're running you right now as your own independent or as your own business, as an employee, and then be able to evaluate on there, how are we doing, you know, are, are my marketing strategies working? Are we building business? Are we seeing different uh, times of the year where business is up? right before summer and then summer comes everybody bails right before summer's ending everybody's back before the holidays you know influxes so you want to be able to make necessary changes to your budget and this may be seasonal or quarterly that kind of come in set new goals um, set up new opportunities that you want to pursue new equipment you want to bring in a partner uh, an employee what, whatever it might be okay so increase income um, basically provides you additional opportunities to improve yourself as a professional and your ability to uh, be successful like you would, I always use the term, a real job. Like you would in a real job where you have health benefits, you have retirement, you have savings, you have the, uh, the possibility and the potential to give yourself paid time off. These are all things that you can do as an independent business owner, but also as an independent contractor if you set the system up to be done for you. In, in most businesses or real jobs, as I call it, uh, the business does it for you. You work a certain amount of hours, you get these many hours and paid time off, or you get benefits, or you get a you know, 401k or whatever it might be. Okay, so in this format, if we create a budget where you're taking 5% of your earnings every quarter, and you're putting that away for retirement, and another 3% that goes into your savings, and another 5% that's going to marketing, we can look, and again, I'll show you that budget in a second, we can start to break some of those up based off of how successful you are being, how well things are working, and start to increase some of those as you go. So you are the one creating the system, implementing the system that is gonna work for you in the long run, that allows you to have all the things you would get at a real job. The beauty of working for yourself and independently is that you get to set the schedule, you get to wear what you want. I choose to wear a uniform, I choose to have, choose to set, have set hours in here. I, you know, I choose to do all these things because I want structure, I want consistency, but it's based on my demands, it's based on my uh, wants and needs and what I think is right and as an independent business owner you should have those philosophies you should have strategies of how you want things done and when you hire someone else to work for you you are the boss now right that's where I like the idea of having a business as an LLC or as your your independent business where you're the boss and you make all the decisions because you have all the responsibility so it should be done your way your way is the best way okay but in this stage in our lives and in our business, we don't really know what that is just yet. We're still building the kind of the foundation of the, of the budget. So again, I'm sure you can't see this very well, but basically what we look at is a, um, a yearly rent, professional liability insurance, dues for my membership and for my certification, first aid CPR, continued education, going to conferences, um, buying new business cards and a schedule book, I have to get those every year, uh, getting a new printer or printer paper, office supplies, uniforms, telephone, internet, marketing campaigns, gas for my vehicle if I'm traveling to and from people's homes, new equipment that I want to purchase every quarter or every, every year, um, gifts for my clients, raffles, events, anything else that I'm hosting here, then paying my income taxes, right, my taxes that come in, which is another part of running your own business and only accepting cash. You're not really being a true professional. Though, you know, the government needs their peace and whatnot, what this is doing on the other side is when you get to a time where you want to take out a business loan or build a bigger gym or again, buy into a membership facility where you're gonna have membership for your, your, uh, your, your clients that's not just a small studio setting, all the income you've been collecting in cash no longer shows up anywhere. So your ability to now qualify for higher uh, credit for bigger incomes or bigger loans and such, you don't have the income to back it up because you've only been accepting cash. So on this side, professionally speaking, 
I'm, I'm an all, I want every, you can accept cash, but report it, right? That's what I'm saying is we got to really show and like work our business structure wise, professionally, honestly, as we go through this, put all this in here so we can see everything on paper. And then based on this whole, whole setup, I've gone across here with all those categories that I talked about. I've priced out basically in kind of a, a, a mock setting what prices would be for each of those. Rent, $6,000 a year if I'm an independent contractor. Professional liability, $400 a year. Uh, professional dues, $125. First aid CPR, $35 and so on. And then based off of kind of the average personal trainer's income around forty-five dollars to $55,000 a year, what percentages of my income does that break up to? So once you get to a point where 13% of my income every year is goes away to my rent, now I can do year after year after year and budget this thing out and see where are all my consistencies at, where can I grow, where can I invest more into my retirement or my education or whatnot, okay? We wanna see as your business and your total income starts to grow, you're able to grow some of these other areas that bring uh, financial security and job security to you. Again, the, the goal making the, the real job benefits a reality for us as independents, okay? So you'll be able to see that when we take a little bit closer look uh, if I send you the, or when, if you'd like the PDFs when I send it to you after. This is the more recent article, the one that just came out, it's out in the current issue of the PTQ. It's before you jump considerations prior to going out on this quest of opening your own studio or your own gym. And so we have three reasons basically that you would wanna go and do this, okay? And, and these are ones that I want you to be really honest with yourself if you're considering and, and really kind of dive into here and see are these really uh, situations for me. So right now the first one, limited or no opportunity to increase your income. We talked about some facilities putting caps on you. Maybe you're working 30 hours a week one-on-one -on -one, and you're not allowed to work more than 30 or you're not allowed to, pre uh, to train semi-private because uh, the gym's a one-on-one -on -one facility and we don't want to overpopulate the gym because membership is here, okay? So maybe you have, uh, you have some kind of restriction there. You're not allowed to do boot camps. You're not allowed to you know, do any outside services you want to do if you want to sell supplements or any of the other things that you want to do. We're basically capping or, or restricting the amount of, of income you can really get. Once I hit my 30 hours at $50 an hour, that's all I can earn. I'm $6,000 a month and that's it. I cannot financially make any more. Then I may want to go look at, at doing something on my own. The second one is I have limited or no opportunity for professional growth. So when we look at that, your ability as a entry-level trainer or a floor supervisor, if you would, uh, to come in and clean the facility and learn how to use the equipment, start mentoring under someone else, eventually get certified in your next step, I'm a certified personal trainer, I can start training clients. As you build a clientele, you start to get more consistent, your education goes to the next level, maybe you earn your degree or you get a secondary certification, you start to build a specialty, and then, okay, you're the head personal trainer, we want you to start um, teaching other trainers in the uh, in the building in our in our office how to do the job right, and then after three four years down the line, uh, maybe the director position opens. You can move into the director. After ten or fifteen years of working as the director, a assistant general manager position. If we don't have these steps in your current environment, if that's a goal to work through the ability to train clients to eventually teach others and then to manage, and you don't have those opportunities where you're at, you may want to go look to go do something on your own. Though as an independent contractor or as a private business owner here, I don't have these steps. I still have the opportunity to progress myself as a professional in the industry, going out and speaking, offering mentorships, bringing other trainers in here, hiring them, managing my team. I can create that myself. And as the team gets more successful and does better, there's a financial reward for the gym or for myself and so on. So you can create that, uh, that opportunity for you in your own environment as that comes up. The third one, Limited or no health benefits. I think we hit this one pretty hard. Um, the ability to hit a full-time status, uh, earn any kind of health benefits, very, very rare in this industry. Most of them are capped. We would rather have as a, you know, a commercial gym, we'd rather have 20 trainers all working 20 hours a week rather than have 10 trainers working 40 hours a week. Because because we don't want to get to the point of having to offer that or having to invest in anybody, we'd have, rather have this you know bigger team of less invested time. If some of them come, let some of them go. There's really not a huge emphasis on quality. Like it becomes a big problem in the long run. In my opinion, uh, I'd rather have fewer really good trainers and give them the rewards 
of earning benefits and earning opportunities because they're putting this in effort into the point where this is their career choice. It's not this little part-time job. And so when we talk about this, this cycle, like I talked about last week, this downward cycle we have in this industry of all these bad trainers getting kicked out and then all these people are like, oh, trainers suck, they have this bad reputation, it's because of that. Because as a trainer, if I have a cap where I can't make any money, I have no opportunity to grow and I can't have a retirement, all things I would have in a real job, if I can't have any of those, why would I stay and do this? So they quit or they only have a part-time effort or they only do it for a while until something else comes up that provides them that offer. So we are doing it to ourselves. In this industry, we're doing it to ourselves. We are the problem. We talk about that 10% approval rating, it's because of this. Because it's really hard for trainers to make a full-time effort, to get a full-time career and have benefits. Something that allows them to stay in it for 30, 40 years, okay? So in this case, most times, we gotta go and do it ourselves. And fortunately, this industry has you know 320 million people in the US. Um, pretty much all of them could use personal training or use some help along the lines either with looking better, feeling better, performing better, you know, something along the lines with a, a physical limitation or an event that's coming up or something. There are a lot of people out there that could use us. So business-wise, we have a lot of clientele or potential clientele, potential consumers that we can pursue. The problem is showing that we're worthy of their trust and worthy of their investment. And that's where the quality of the trainer struggles at, okay? So now that we've looked at and we've decided, all right, I think I wanna go and do this on my own and we see some of the issues we're gonna to try to fix. We have five questions now that you wanna be able to answer, in my opinion, yes to before you go and do it. Number one, am I an expert on my demographic for the people that I'm working with, okay? When I say expert, I don't mean industry recognized and you've authored books and all this, but I mean you know an extensive amount of knowledge on this. And maybe the majority of your clientele, they focus on this or they work with us. Older populations, youth, uh, disabilities, uh, pregnancy, um, sports performance, you know, bodybuilding, whatever it might be, whatever your kind of your primary, your focus is, are you really well known for that, at least in your building, as being an expert, okay? Where you have a little bit of a reputation. Do you have some advanced level certifications to go with that? In a, a ever-growing community of consumers that have been burned from box gyms that you know, they wanted their long-term investment for membership and they, they found less value, but now they're committed, so they're mad about their money getting lost there. We've had enough, if you would, suckers that have kind of gone through some of these pitfalls. And I was there too, I'm, I'm still paying for a, a membership to a local franchise here, a lifetime one that, um, that I don't use anymore, but they got me, right? So we've had enough consumers that have gone through this to where they're looking at a trainer and saying, I need to make sure this is the right person for me. I need to know that they're knowledgeable. I need to know they maybe they're being referred to me from someone else. I need a live walking, talking referral, uh, not, not, a, not a billboard or a flyer. I need someone that can genuinely say this person is great at what they do, a very strong referral. But on paper, number one, I need to look good too. Do I have the education, the certifications? Have I put in my time? Am I known? Have I published or authored certain things, okay? So we need to have at least some primary certifications and secondary certifications that kind of back us up on the idea that we're an expert working in this field, all right? Do I have years of experience working with my demographic? Have I worked through internships, mentorships, shadowing? Have I, I read every and, and every possible book that I could get on this? Have I gone to conferences specifically on these topics? Do I still seek out that information now? You need to be a student of your specialty, not just of personal training, but of the thing that really calls to you. Because the more that you are consumed with that, the more it oozes out of you when you have opportunities working with people. You can't help or restrict your passion, things that you're really into, it just comes out. People are gonna see it and they're gonna know it. So if you have the, the work experience, the mentors, the, the, the coaches, the experience working on the floor and doing that, years of building the reputation, the certifications behind you, all of this builds a reputation to where if you do go, okay, this next one here, if I do go out on my own, I open my own place, this is not field of dreams. You can't open your doors, plop a gym down, and say, I built it, they'll come. It doesn't work that way. We have to have a reputation for what we do, who we work with, how we do it. Okay, and that is a must in this industry. We are 99.9% .9 referral based or word of mouth based. And though we spend, you know, 20, 30% of our, of our budgets, 
towards marketing every year, it seems to always come back to the idea that referral word of mouth is our best tool, collectively speaking, industry-wise, okay? So looking at that, have I done all the things that build my reputation to the point where when I do relocate or go to my new spot, open my doors, I've got a following, I've got people that have heard of me, that know of me, that are gonna help me build my business. And then, do you have the commitment to the next level of training? Because we see this a lot, very committed trainer, very into what they're doing, very into learning, open their own business, and they worry more about running the business than they do about being the trainer, which is the first passion, the first thing that they really were into, the very beginning that got them so passionate about this. Well, now my butt's on the line, my money is on the line, I gotta run this business, I gotta be here cleaning bathrooms, and I gotta be here, you know, working the shifts when my other trainers are out of town, and I gotta, oh, my lights and the, you know, the light and the thing and the, you know, all these things that start coming up business-wise, all these issues that come in, we become the business owner first and we forget about the things that we're truly passionate about, about working with the people and about learning how to help them. And so we have to have the commitment and the ability to keep doing that, to have that fire keep burning, if you will, to make sure you are staying the industry leader or the professional or the reputation that you have that's out there that it keeps happening, okay? I hit that Cosgrove line all the time. Someone that's been there, they've done it, and they're still doing it. That's the big one at the end, okay? Learn, build, get it to a point where you're comfortable, you're ready, but as you get there, you have to hit it even harder, in my opinion. You have to put in that time and that effort, okay? And that's what this whole article, again, continues to kind of hit home these points. So if you're hitting yes, you're saying yes to all these, let's take a look at the next bit. Okay, we're gonna look at some of the financial components that are not equipment and uh, a, a billboard outside. There are so many little hidden things that kind of come in here that we don't really think about if you haven't run a business before um, that start to come up and you're like, man, I never really thought about that. Okay, so I'm gonna get to some really good detailed um, examples here in just a little bit. But just to give you a little, again, this is very, very tiny, I understand that. This top one here is just your basic business responsibilities. Your business license, your LLC, um, basic maintenance of rent, common area maintenance or your triple net, maintaining the facility, all of your utilities, gas, electric, water, sewer, anything else in the area that you might be in, your phone, your internet, your security system, we forget about that one, the cleaning crew that comes in and cleans or does your bathrooms or whatever it might be. Remember, you're a personal trainer that wants to open and run a gym, not clean bathrooms, okay? Uh, not that there's anything wrong with that. I was a janitor for six years through high school and college. There's nothing wrong with that, but what are you doing now? There's better time spent now. Okay, that's what you need to be doing and working on. Financial responsibilities go into paying back your loans, legal fees for lawyers to review all of your paperwork and your, uh, your lease, uh, fee, your, your lease uh, paperwork, okay? Um, quarterly payments to your accountant to do your taxes. Again, I don't change my own oil because I don't know anything about cars. I'm not an expert on that, so I bring it to someone who knows what they're doing. Okay, same with our taxes. I strongly encourage you to use somebody that knows what they're doing. This is, this is such a, I don't want to use the word, you know, big legal risk, but it's all on you, man. This is, this is 100% on you, financial-wise, uh, responsibility-wise. So you don't cut corners. Don't, you know, have your, your grandpa's buddy that, that used to be an accountant do your tech. Hire somebody that's, you know, they're now, they're current, they know what they're doing, they're gonna do a good job for you. It's worth the investment. It's not a cost if it's beneficial and if it's doing the job, okay? So these are good investments. You just gotta think about it. Outfitting your gym. Boy, where do we start with this? Racks, dumbbells, barbells, all the cool stuff. We get that. Rubber flooring, maintaining the flooring, installing the flooring, okay? Uh, locker rooms, bathrooms, restrooms, if you're gonna do all that. Supplies to go on all those. Soaps, containers, paper towels, tissues, um, you know, paper cups, a water fountain, storage for cubbies, towels, washer and dryer, all of your gym towels, your gym wipes, excuse me, all your other issues that might come up, uh, or other uh, products that you might need. Software and marketing, how are you checking people in? How are you doing your billing? What is your marketing software looking like? What materials are you using? Signs outside, we'll talk about this in a second, super expensive, depending on the quality that you want. Uh, the the uh, window decals, your banners, your signs, your t-shirts, your water bottles, your towels, a lot of this stuff that we think, oh, it's just a couple hundred, it's not. Social media, free to use for the most part, unless you're boosting and all that, but a big time investment to do it well. Okay, so these are times where, if I looked at collectively, I don't, boy, I don't even know, this might be open in a can of worms. If I looked at collectively, how many, I'm gonna say hours a day, that I spend on social media, posting, putting up whatever I'm doing, something like this, okay? Though it's all, 
productive and your you know potentially marketing and finding referrals and it's still time that an hour a day two hours a day whatever it might be that you're putting in that could be used on you know creating the new program design for the next client for you know straightening the gym and getting it ready for the next hour group or writing up work whatever it might be right there's there's better time spent or other opportunities to spend to improve or another hour of training clients that you can open up instead of using your social media so we always think you now it's it's free to use it not necessarily free to use yes but it's still there's still an investment of time that you need to look at and there's only so much in this day as we go through your website if you're gonna do marketing materials and emails and that kind of stuff who are you using what software are you using with that so that's just the, the bare bones basic considerations you want to come into it doesn't really dive into the specifics of what specific type of gym you might be if you're working with youth or older adults or whatever it might be there might be even more equipment or more um, you know special special demands that you might have okay a couple things that I wanted to hit home on budgeting for the studio or the small gym signage and permits I put on here time and money um, our sign that we put up here is non-lit it's a hardened aluminum and it's uh, eight feet by four feet something like that it was a thousand dollars to make it it was another eight hundred dollars to install it and then we had to buy a permit just to have it installed in the first place that they had to come out and see beforehand and after that it was done correctly and there was going to be a fee that if I didn't have it all prepped and put in correctly that I was responsible for and then if I my, my permit if it's not on the premises if they come to inspect there's a, a fee for that okay or a fine for that so little things like that you need to think about and I got probably the most bare bones sign there's you know you want it illuminated you want a box you want it shiny you want you know 3d whatever it is you could spend thousands of dollars uh, really getting a nice sign put in okay um, we had decals be stronger fitness put on the window I think those were 150 each and then like another hundred dollars each to have them put on I mean it's it's not inexpensive is what I would say to put up these your sign on your little kiosk with a little monument outside that was hundred and seventy five dollars something like that I mean they're these things um, little I don't want to say hidden we just don't think about all the little bits that kind of come together collectively when we just think oh we just need a sign outside okay flooring shipping and installing it is not cheap to get heavy stuff shipped to you unless you're in Ohio <laughs> right next to rogue or, or whoever you're ordering from it's expensive to get stuff here uh, so we've actually we, we looked at our equipment in three different tiers what we needed immediately and then what we wanted stage number one and then what we wanted stage number two and we would wait on stages one and two until we had five thousand dollars of equipment to order just so we could get the free shipping because you could order four thousand dollars worth of equipment and it's twenty two hundred dollars to ship it to you you may as well just order another hundred you know another thousand uh, dollars worth of equipment to get it shipped here for free so these prices, um, though it's really good quality stuff, I'm not bagging on it, it's just expensive to get it here. So you gotta think about that stuff. Trying to get flooring in for 2,500 square feet, you're looking at 25 to 30 rolls of flooring, or if you're doing waffles or squares, how expensive, how heavy that is to get it in here. Prepping the facility first, it needs to adhere to the floor. However you're gonna do it, glue or double stick tape or whatever it is, so the floor has to be scrubbed and sprayed and prepped before you put down your flooring. We. Um, went a little light on our tape just because it was so much work and it was so expensive for the tape. So I think we used half of what we were supposed to, but we have a lot of weights in here holding our flooring down. So we kind of knew we had a, a, a little bit of, a, of an assistant there. Really good quality flooring is huge. And I'll, I'll say this, and I mean, probably four or five more times as we go through this, never buy used equipment, never buy used flooring. If you're, you, you yourself are gonna be responsible for using something, that's, that's one thing, okay? If you're using a used you know, suspension device at your house and it's just for you, that's one thing. But if I'm having you know, your grandmother hang off of a TRX while we're doing rows, it better be insured, number one. It better have a warranty. It better be brand new. And it better not be drugged through a parking lot somewhere. I have no idea what happened to any of that stuff before I got here. So when clients ask me, what do you think of this secondhand or should I buy from Amazon? No, buy direct, in my opinion, buy direct from the producer so you get the warranty if something goes wrong you can send it back in those cases a lot of time you save money on shipping it these are big big expenses on big investments that you need to make sure have a a warranty supporting behind it so if I get a bar I start using it the bar breaks I can send it back rogue Samson Sornak whoever it is it's under warranty I get my product back 
You buy that from a secondhand store, it breaks with a client on it, responsibility goes, responsibility goes to you, number one. Now you got a broken bar that doesn't have a warranty on it. So initial investment, I'm, I'm all about buying one time really good quality. I make jokes, my wife's gonna kill me for saying this. My underwear's $25 a pair because I want good quality stuff. I don't wanna buy $3 underwear I have to replace every other month, okay? I wanna buy good quality shoes, good quality equipment, good quality computers, like quality equipment that's gonna last me a long time, but I'll pay more for that, okay? This stuff is more than just equipment to play on. You are putting people's safety on the line of this. So I can only hit that home so hard. I hope, I hope I'm, I'm not having to sell it to you, number one, but that I'm really hitting it, the emphasis on this, how important that is. So buy good flooring, don't buy used flooring. Um, find flooring that number one if you're gonna install it yourself is installed really well all the corners are tucked in you don't have lips that are sticking up everything is level if you have to have a change from one surface to the next have an even keel you know the smooth separators that go in between like safety first when it comes to this stuff I've seen too many people trip and fall or or drop weights and it's against something too tight or a roll of flooring here or a stack of bumpers there buy squat rack stack you know bumper plates that that will stack on a rack like you know make things look professional because you're the one responsible for it okay so sorry to rant on that but that's an important one that I see people skimp on all the time I'm just gonna get this I just need to get up and running you're not gonna run long if you get sued okay you gotta have some responsibility here um, same thing with equipment shipping installation flooring installation I'll hit on this too you could get flooring for uh, two dollars a square foot for like okay flooring or thirty five dollars a square foot there, there's not a, like a common price it depends on what you want where it's going do you want waffle flooring do you want non-slip flooring do you want rolls do you, I mean it just depends on what you want there's fitness carpet now what if you want the whole place to be turf that you want to go in that's really expensive do you want it to be logoed do you want it to just be regular do you want it speckled do you want it black I'll tell you not to buy all black flooring because a drop of a, of a flake of dust off of your white towel shows up on that flooring. So have some kind of speckled, some kind of logo speckled color, at least ours is uh, blue and white that we have in here to match our logo, okay? So these types of things, uh, little things that we learned our lessons on, um, it helps to have installation if you don't know how to do it. I, I had experience in the past installing equipment and working for a local company, so I knew how to do that. I knew how to do flooring for the most part, and it helped uh, a couple other gyms do that. Um, facility supplies, cleanings, and more. Um, I am a huge fan of my bathrooms are, it's kind of like uh, if someone looks at your car, it's a represent representation of you and your life and how you live. Um, if your car's a mess, you're probably a mess. If your car's well kept and so on. Uh, again, this is kind of a, a goofy little, um, you know, a goofy little analogy you could use. I think your bathrooms are a very big representation of how you want to take care of your business and, and produce uh, an environment that is safe and comfortable and clean for people to be in. I think the bathrooms are the best one. And a lot of people will come in, they'll check out your gym and they look at the bathroom, okay? So when they go in there, what kind of supplies do you have? How clean do you keep it? How well maintenance is it? How often is it maintenance? Even having a little chart up that says, this is maintenance every Tuesday and Friday between these hours. Having the cleaners come in maybe while you're in session in the gym so people see, ah, it is getting clean. Like we, we do that too. And it is a studio, it's a small place, but it still needs to be kept uh, up to up to par and up to some standards and your your consumers will respect that number one they'll appreciate it number two and it goes into the overall uh, reputation of the business and uh, the professional mindset that you are sh setting and sharing with them it all kind of comes into that okay so without harping on this so long uh, maybe I already have but installation on this quality of the product you have maintenance of it very very important when it's your name, your responsibility, your financial investment, um, this needs to be taken to the highest priority and, and invested well in, okay? Just to give you an idea, financially, I'm gonna go through this just real quick, okay? Put that on here. Uh, we're already in a half hour. Hopefully you all don't mind me going a little long. I planned for a half hour, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk for a bit. Squat rack, $1,100 or $2,200 each, okay? We get one of those. A flat bench, $175, we get two of those. Bumper sets up to a 230 pounds each set. Okay, we're looking at four thousand dollars already right there. Um, 45 pound bar, 250 each. I get four of them. There's another thousand collars, 45 dollars a pair. I need uh, five of those. That's 180. Landmine units, 125 dollars each. I need two of those. Rings and suspension straps, 300 dollars, 150 dollars for those. 900 dollars per rowing machine. I need two of those. That's 1800. Five to 55, five to 50 pound dumbbells by fives. 
660 a set, I need two of those, that's 1320. The rack for the dumbbells to go on. Remember, I don't want trip hazards where all my weights are on the floor. A couple okay, but not all of them. 450, a, uh, a storage rack. I need one, maybe two of those. Plyo boxes. I work with older populations. Wood, wide to narrow plyo boxes are not great for my population. I like the soft, squishy, big, you know, full squared plyo boxes. I can jump on really expensive, $1,100 per set. Okay, so I have one of those. Uh, kettlebell set, eight to 24 kilos, 350 a set. And then battling ropes, one or two of those, 360. Okay, so that's uh, $10,000 total, 10360 plus shipping and taxes, $2,450 to get it here, plus installation, $1,200 for that. Uh, grand total, $14,000 for that bit of equipment that I talked about right there. So though I rattled through that really, really quickly, we're only talking about a rack, bumper plates, bars, collars, two ropes, two rowers, and a set of kettlebells. I mean, that's pretty basic, simple stuff. You'll see two, three, four times that amount of stuff in a regular, like, decent sized gym, okay? So you see how quickly it all adds up, how much it is to get it here, and that's the investment you gotta dive into. Just for the basic, this is what I need to open, right? Let alone all the stuff that I want, all right? So once we get to that point, we know who we are, we know where we're going, we have an idea of our budget. Really, it's called forecasting, because it's what, what can I afford and what uh, number of clientele am I gonna start with? As we grow and I get a little bit bigger and more successful, am I hiring more? Uh, hopefully we get more business in. Let's say we're at point A, then point B, then point C. Forecast forward and see where do I need to be? What certain amount of incomes do I need to make before I can get into my next level of equipment? But let's just, you know, bare, I don't wanna say bare minimum because you wanna get all your good stuff, but what are the basic necessities, the needs that you need to open? And then I can get my wants later on. I can get my sleds later, I can get my secondary, you know, ropes, my extra set of sandbags, my aerodyne bike, like whatever it is that's, that's not necessarily needed on a day-to-day -day basis, okay? Once we have all that together, and you know you're ready to go, you've scouted some locations, here's some things to think about location-wise. Opening near a strip mall, something along those lines, typically franchises are, are sought out uh, because strip malls, they usually the business owners wanna have some kind of history or some kind of pre, um, pre-success story of you. So if you're in the area, you've been there for a while, you have some commitment from clients who've shown consistency over years of being there, then that helps, right? That's that's pretty good consistent story. Or if a franchise is really well known, they're gonna say, okay, come on in, this is good, right? So strip malls can be, cannot be, depends, okay? Finding locations that are near your clientele. I've seen gyms, they're like, oh, it's only three miles further away. Well, that's fine in the beginning. And then when it becomes a pretty big inconvenience, when it's during rush hour, when anything else that's going along, it's outside my, my normal route, my normal circle, after time, it becomes a little bit of a burden, and maybe uh, that gets dropped after time. New space or converted space, basically wanna look at um, finding things that are convenient for you. It's not gonna be a huge startup cost for you to uh, have to um, reset up the building if you're, if you're not um, negotiating that in with your original lease and so on. So finding a good location, could be a strip mall, could be a freestanding facility. Uh, another thing to look at, and I really like to suggest this to people that are coming from an employee situation is to go sublease from another current gym. Work as an independent contractor. What this does, it's kind of a halfway step between getting to be your own boss but also having someone else there to kind of support you and help you. Uh, it's a good first step. You get to be involved. You get to start making some decisions. You get instant access to equipment uh, they already have there that you get to use. You have some space where you can bring in your own maybe. Um, you, you start to bring in some uh, current clientele start to build. It's a little bit of extra income or some rent for the gym owner, so it's a win for them there. It gives you experience running the business. It gives you someone, hopefully, to maybe be mentored by or to learn from a little bit as you go. The freedom of being your own boss, but without the huge financial risk or gain until you're comfortable and you kind of know what you're doing. Could lead to a business partner, you never know, or good opportunities. I'm not a big business partner guy. I, I can't really think of or have seen, again, I, they may be out there, but I haven't seen a whole lot of business partners that last for decades or long periods of time together in this industry. Um, typically, at some point, there's a break and there's a missed you know, direction of, I want to take things this way and I want to take this, things this way. And usually that partnership breaks and becomes two different businesses that are now battling with each other for clientele and such. So, could be an opportunity there. Um, not, not something I would, I would necessarily encourage, but uh, it, it depends. Okay. 
and then the chance to continue to build a clientele with having your own space. So you have some opportunities for that. Other things to think about, little things, uh, parking spots. If I'm a semi-private model facility where I can train up to eight people a day, plus me, that's nine parking spots. Plus I'm gonna have at some point new business coming in, my nine o'clock group, as I'm finishing with my eight o'clock group. So that's another eight people. So now we're at 16 plus me is 17 people. Plus we might have a couple people come in and out uh, here and there, starting early, starting late, new business and wants to pull up. I need at least 20, 25 parking spots just for me, in my opinion, every hour. Now, if you're in a strip mall, other businesses, anything like that, that, that's a whole other issue, a whole other thing to look at. In our facility here, majority of our business is done by 11 every day, and most of the other businesses here don't open until 9, 30, 10. So for us, it was a big perk. We get, get the place pretty much to ourselves until the very end of our day where things overlap a little bit, and in the afternoons, most of them are closing by the time we're starting back up again. So that was a big perk for us, even though we, have, we don't have you know 60 parking spots, we've got about 25 here. Uh, that work pretty well for all the businesses. Um, neighbors, we had one place, the other gym we were at, um, that was called The Office. I didn't know it, but it was a bar. <laughs> so you could say, honey, I'm going to The Office. Uh, they go by to the bar. There are ones where there's a car wash right next door, or tons of cars and traffic coming through. Um, a laundromat, again, cars, noise, heat, that kind of stuff. Um, think about the people around you, the accessibility. Is it a one-way street? Do they have to flip a U-turn to get into you every time? They have to drive into narrow entrances at one way. Okay, some, some issues like that that might come up. Do you have the opportunity or space, space to grow? Uh, I've seen, you know, small, small time, I don't want to say small time, small gyms, small businesses start small, they start to grow, they find another space and it's six times the, the size that they currently have. They're like, oh, we're going to grow into this. And so they take this huge jump to this next level. Instead of overflowing out of the space they were in, and then upgrading or having the opportunity to grow into the space next to them or to, to you know, expand and buy a next unit or get some more office space or whatever it might be, they jump from a thousand square foot studio to a 10,000 foot gym. Uh, and, and not that that's not successful, but that's a huge jump. I'd rather you be in a space where 2,000 square feet, we're doing great, we're overflowing, let's buy into the space next to us. Or someone else moves, another gym, you know, another business moves away, and now we have, we have space to expand the gym into that spot next. You can ask for first right of refusal. Okay, business going good, we're happy, we want whatever next space opens up, we wanna have the first option to expand into that. Or if the uh, owners of the building have multiple buildings, if they have another spot that opens up that's nearby, I, I would like to be you know, notified on that. Just ask your people, work with your, your people. Again, a whole other thing I could go into, negotiations and leases and all that. You can have some really, really good owners and you can have some not so good ones. So make sure you're a communicator, you're talking to people, okay? Um, the front of the store, you want it to look attractive. You want to have not only like good parking spots, but everything looks nice. The front of the store looks good. It's, in, it's inviting. Your signage is, is, you know, seen. We don't have the best signage here, but again, we're a referral-based business. We don't get a whole lot of walk-ups. We don't have membership. We're all studio-based. So when clients come in, it's per their schedule. So people can find us and they can see if they're looking for us, but we don't have the best, you know, roadside as you're going by. You're not going to see our sign uh, or our banners flying in the wind type of thing. If that's gonna be a, a primary goal of yours and a marketing technique, make sure you have that, okay? Now, building layout. You'll see some buildings you walk in and you're like, oh, these are eight foot ceilings. They might be drop ceilings. You might have another eight feet above that, so look into those. Um, weight bearing walls. We looked at one facility before we got here. I'm like, oh, all these walls are great. There, there were two of them that were weight bearing. And one of them was right down the middle of the facility. So we couldn't actually open it up and spread it out like we wanted. It was 3,000 square feet but it was uh, 14, 14 on one side and 16 on the other. It was a weight bearing wall. We couldn't cut windows in it, nothing. And so we were gonna have this big horseshoe of a gym that we couldn't see the other side. I didn't like that, right? Um, flooring, what does the floor look like? Is it level? Are you gonna have a bunch of stuff you gotta rip out? Can you put your current flooring down over it? What kind of issues might come in there? Uh, heating, air, and windows. Do your windows leak air conditioning like crazy? Do they sit? You know, west facing, you're gonna get hit by the sun all afternoon and heat it up. Uh, are you gonna have to put in new blinds? Is your air conditioner within four or five years old? Are you responsible for it? Is the, the property owner uh, responsible for it? Are you sharing it? Do you have other units that are sharing your air conditioning? Uh, are, are you gonna have to pay for all the heating, the maintenance of that? Like, look into all that kind of stuff. You get stuck into a couple of things that you may not wanna do. Um, it's tough to give you a range on financial Square footage, I would say, and financially how much you're gonna do. It depends on the city, the, 
the state that you're in, the space you're looking for, your neighbors, the area of town. There's too many. There's too many um, factors that could come into what it would be. Uh, but just to give you an idea, I'd say warehouses, two to three, four dollars a square foot. Where more residential, you know, you're in neighborhood strip malls could be ten to fifteen dollars. It just it really depends on where you're at and who's by you. I've seen stores that there's a Whole Foods across the street, and because they are there, this spot is ten dollars a square foot, and you go up a block and it's two dollars a square foot. So it just depends on who's around you, how much space you're looking at, the quality of that, and so on. So um, typically, a studio or a small gym, I think we're looking around five hundred to 2,500 square feet, that number might change a little bit based on industry standards, but basically a smaller space uh, is what we would define as a studio or a small gym. Um, so when you're when you're looking into licensing and all that kind of stuff, that's what you would declare as. Uh, entry, lighting, we saw some really great spaces, big high ceilings, it was lovely, but the lighting was really poor. We had no skylights, we didn't have really big windows, so the place was really dark. All that's gonna kind of feed into uh, the setting or in the environment, even with white paint or something like that, it's hard to, lighten up a dark environment. So look into that. What do the doors look like? Do you have garage door access? Are there sliders? Are there skylights? Are there other things that are gonna leak or you're gonna have to fix or work on? Okay, go through all that stuff. Um, also things to think about depending on the state you're in. The height of your water fountain. Do you have uh, handlebars next to uh, your, uh, your toilets in the bathrooms? Are the sinks set at the appropriate height? Do you have a push handle um, one side locking only door to get in and out. We had two double doors with one unlock on it. We had to get fixed right away. Uh, coming in here, all these little standards and the codes that you need to know about, uh, not only working with the property owner or the management company, but have some people on your side too that can kind of look at those things and say, yes, all this looks good or these things. The fire, um, the, the fire heads up here, they have to have a cage on them or a sensor or something like that. If you're in one of those states, those could be $50, $60 a, a cage. Like it just, it just depends on where you're at, but don't miss the little details. We can get so excited. I'm like, this is going to be my spot. I'm so pumped. I just want to sign. I want to get it going. And you're, you know, two, three, four thousand dollars into getting new fire extinguishers put in or, or, or new windows because there's, there's dry rot. It just depends on the situation, of course, but take your time, feel it out, invest in the people, your lawyer, your property manager, whatever it might be to make sure that you're in a good spot, that you're being treated fairly and negotiate well, okay? Vertical options are big uh, for smaller environments, or smaller gyms, because if you have a lot of stuff on the ground, it takes up more space for, you, for where your people can train. So we have a, a little warm-up area, and then the rest of the gym, it could look different every day, but basically it's a little l shape. We have all of our equipment and our racks on that side, and a little bit of stuff over here, and the rest of this is just open. So as people come in, we might have all the hex bars and deadlifts and everything out, and the next day, all that's gone. The next day we might have bars and ropes and sandbags on it and then it all goes back. So we have enough space where we can stack things vertically, store them up well, and then when we want them, we pull them down, we use them, and we put them back, okay? So vertical storage is big, but you gotta have space to be able to put that in. And again, vertical storage, especially with heavy stuff, can be really uh, financially challenging, I guess I would say. I'll show you an example of that. In a minute. Um, we talked about this, what do you need versus what do you want? Bracket that out, give yourself some budgets and some aggressions to go towards. Okay, almost done here. My suggestions, as far as equipment comes in, um, if you can see this here, these are dumbbells and kettlebells and bumper plates that are all stacked in one, two, three, four, five shelves. That's gotta be some really industrial, like heavy duty, strong materials to hold thousands of pounds of that, but boy, does it look good. You know, everything's stacked up and put in there and put away, and they can pull down what they want. When you have limited space, you gotta have that. Okay. These guys are all stacked. These are those multi-use dumbbells where you, you know, the, the little hexagon and you pull and you move the stuff as you need it and the mirrors and the vertical med ball storage and, you know, physio balls up on the top here, all the suspension devices, punching bags that lower down, like all that stuff, big investment to make it look good, to have it store, but boy, does it leave everything open, right? That's really important if you're going to be in some small spaces. So my basic suggestions, get two of everything. Uh, if you're a one-on-one -on -one environment, at least you could have two trainers going. But if you're a small group or partner, at least, it's nice to have somebody working with you at stations or in, in different um, uh, you know, components of the workout as you go through. Uh, purchase equipment that has multiple use. So a chest press machine is nice, but pretty much all it does is a chest press. For the footprint that you can use and, and the space that it takes up for only one uh, product or one service that it's gonna provide, um, that's tough for me to invest to put that into a small facility. 
So I want to use stuff that has multiple uses that can be moved around, you know, fairly easily. Things that can be stored vertically, like we talked about. Things that are easily cleaned. Clients really like clean equipment. They like it so much, they'll help you do it. My clients, they, I insist that they help me when we do this, but we get to the point where they're the ones cleaning and they're the ones requiring other people. You didn't wipe that down, right? This is, and they take pride in making sure everything is nice, and I love that, right? But it, it's our standard that we set. And as long as you're willing to supply the clean materials and make that a standard, um, we want good, easy to clean equipment that it gets cleaned up easy, stored away easy. Your clients will help you do that. You want equipment that is easily maintained. If it's broken, it's easily replaced. It's durable, it's sturdy, and it's safe. As I hit uh, quite a few times, never, never, never buy used equipment. Everybody say that with me. Never buy used equipment, thank you. Okay, last little bit. Just finishing up, I am here to help you. I know that was a ton of information, and I ran quite a bit over my uh, expended time, ended up turning into an hour talk. I hope you don't mind. Uh, but I get rolling on this stuff, and I just wanna share as much with, I can, uh, with you as I can. Uh, if there's anything else that comes up, questions, anything else I could do to help you out, feel free to email me, robertlinkle at gmail, uh, bestrongerfitness.com. You can always send us a message on there. I'm on Facebook, as you know. I'm on uh, Instagram, LinkedIn. Uh, however you want to get a hold of me, I'm here to help. I'm happy to help you. As long as it's not working in with us having a baby or uh, running the business here, I'll get back to you as soon as I can. Uh, again, I hope you enjoyed this. I hope it helps. Good luck to you out there that are getting ready to go and do this. Make sure it's the right time for you. That you have all your ducks in a row. Take your time. Uh, this facility was seven years of dreaming it here, probably four years of actual work, of making it come together, of budgeting, putting it together thinking about the whole thing, where are we gonna go, how are we gonna do it, and then 18 months of really hard work to make that happen. So take your time, do it well, and you will survive. Um, the field of dreams, it doesn't exist, okay? Don't build it and they'll come, you gotta make it happen. And I think you can if you go through these steps correctly. Hope you enjoyed it, thank you for joining us, and uh, we'll see you next week, see ya.